It is Wednesday, June 28th, 2023. This is another edition of Baseball Today. That is my man, Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose. Producer Rob Scirocco along for the ride as well today. We greatly appreciate it. We start off with a tip of the cap to two people. J.D. Martinez with two bombs and the Dodgers win out in Colorado. He joins the 300 home run club. Congrats to J.D. And your old teammate, Eduardo Escobar. He joined a pair of new teams over the last week, got traded from the Mets to the Halos, and he officially became an American citizen. The picture of him is so amazing. I'm sure you're so proud of your former teammate. And look at the smile on his face, dude. I, I love Eddie. And, you know, he's he's lived here for quite some time. And mm-hmm. for him to be able to establish himself here is awesome for him and his family. That's the thing I always tell people is, you know, when you – hang around guys who aren't from the U S I know we have our troubles here in the country, but like talk to them about what they think about the United States. And like, it's, it's special when that happens and uh, I'm proud of him. And you're right. Two teams change is pretty cool. I hope uh, that they make the playoffs just so I can see him in the playoffs. Yeah. More than Shohei and Trout. I need to see Eddie in the playoffs. Okay. Well, let's start it off by talking a little bit about Shohei because he just seemingly does something that wows us each and every day. Last night, pitched into the seventh inning, was awesome. Another double-digit strikeout game. He had homered in his first at-bat off of Copic. And then, of course, he homered again later in the game. It's the first time in his career that he has had a multi-homer game while being the starting pitcher. In your opinion, has he reached Patrick Mahomes, Steph Curry, LeBron hype train sort of area? This is an interesting question. This is like a deep thought kind of question. Um, I don't think he's there yet, and it's not his fault. I think that baseball players have traditionally had a hard time joining that conversation. If you, There's these guys on Instagram and TikTok. I see them on Instagram. The baseball bat boys. Okay, mm-hmm. And they go around to different types of events, and they ask people, like, who's your favorite player? And dang, dude, do so many people still say Derek Jeter or Ken Griffey Jr. Like those are the guys that people who like aren't necessarily following baseball will still mention. And we have stars in today's game, you know, Mike Trout, Mookie Betts, they're close. But if you're not following the game of baseball, you're not going to, you probably wouldn't mention those guys. Like maybe you'd get Mookie or Mike Trout and Shohei has, has entered that territory as well. But if you just ask random people, who their favorite baseball player is. Like a lot of times you're going to say, I don't really follow baseball or they'll, or they'll go back to Jeter or to Griffey. So I think Shohei can get there and he's well on his way. And, you know, I ask my youth team all the time, like, who's your favorite player? Obviously I'm in LA. I get a lot of Mookies, but everybody knows who Shohei is. So he's getting there. I just think for whatever reason, Um, it's been difficult for baseball players to enter that. We're like, yeah, everyone, you say Steph Curry, everyone knows who Steph Curry is. Everyone knows who LeBron James is. I would say it's less Patrick Mahomes and more Tom Brady still, which maybe is an interesting thing. Um, But Shohei's on his way. But no, I'm to answer your question, no, he's not not there yet. He's not. I I think most baseball fans would would be like, shocked to hear you say that but you're looking at it in exactly the right way unfortunately what i do is not that twitter and social media is the end all be all but i think it's a decent temperature to see where some people are uh this morning i saw amina or late last night i saw amina kimes who's primarily known in the football world tweeting about it basically saying pay attention if you're not, you know, we're not paying attention enough to what Shohei Otani's doing. I mean, pay attention now. Mark. This is, I mean, that's what I'm I saying. Is look, going look what he's been doing. I understand it, but I think that that's where kind of the growth continues outside of the sport of baseball. I think if you mention it to any even average baseball fan, people are finally going like, "Holy shit, we can't make a big enough deal about him." I sat there last night. Ploof. I wrote the first draft of questions. And I sent it out before he hit his second home run. We weren't even going to talk about Shohei Otani. Like, if I had told you 10 years ago there was a starting pitcher who, again, homered in a game where he was also the starter on the mound, we would have been like, what is going on here? But now I've almost accepted it like, yeah, another game, Shohei punches out 10 and hit a home run. 
and I wasn't even going to have it in the show. But then when he did it for the second time, I was like, damn, we got to do it. And people say we talk about Shohei too much. Dude, he's making us talk about him. This this show right here is what are the big topics each night? Shohei is a big topic all the time because he forces his way into those topics. So I don't know. I don't here, here's my let's we can go a little deeper into this. If New Balance doesn't come out with a Shohei sneaker that's like not baseball related, like give me a Shohei like streetwear type sneaker. Please, because that thing will go nuts. Nike, I think, fumbled this huge. Mm. If Nike came out and they had their trout stuff for baseball and then they'd put a Shohei out, I think they could have just, I think it could, it could be like one of the next big shoes for them, but they didn't get them. New Balance got them. So now it's up to New Balance to do that. And I think stuff like that is what gets you into that, uh, you know, stratosphere of, celebrity is when you have a shoe and it's not just baseball it's outside of baseball Shohei hasn't done a lot of stuff outside of baseball yet if he decides to do that then yes I think he starts to enter that category Mm -hmm. I think it's fair I think it's all fair but damn man particularly when he's pitching you have to watch last last night he leaves with a cracked nail and then we're freaking we're like oh my god what's going on because at the when it first happened we didn't know what the injury was then you heard crack nail, and then he freaking hits a home run. It's next to Pat. <laughs> it's sick, nuts, dude. man. He's unreal. Um, so two of the Atlanta Braves, Ronald Acuna hit two of the five homers off of Joe Ryan. Um, Braves have won 12 of 13. They keep a six and a half game lead over the Marlins, who, by the way, banged out 19 hits in their W up at Fenway Park. Luis Arise, another two knocks. He is hitting 399. If he hits 400 this year and the Marlins are in contention all year long, is he the NL MVP? Uh, okay. Do I think so? No, I don't. I think that I love, I love, I mean, it's incredible to watch him play and, and 400 is something that, you know, we just never see any, especially in today's day and age, you just don't see that. Uh, it's going to be an incredible feat. Is he going to get a bunch of, uh, what I give him like MVP consideration and love, of course, but I think Acuna just impacts the game on so many different levels. I mean, how many stolen bases does this guy have right now? Like almost 40, right? What's what is it? Yeah, he's, look it up. Yeah, yeah, he got the, to 35 the other day. I haven't seen the last couple days. So he is yeah, at 35 he... stolen bases. So we're talking right now, he's got 19 homers and he's got 35 stolen bases. We're basically at the exact halfway point. We're talking about a 40 70 season. It's hard to beat yeah, that. I mean, Plus, he's playing yeah, good he, defense. He could slow I down think a little bit. Slow down? Yeah, like on the bases. Like, let's say the Braves are winning the division by seven games with with a week to go. Sure, sure, whatever. Okay, uh, he's on pace for – he's going to get to a 40-40 season if he hits for power the entire year, which is mm-hmm. – how many people have done that? Four? We've yeah, done this on very, the show very before. small group. So – I think, in my opinion, no. Will he get a bunch from votes from writers? Yes, because writers like that type of stuff. And rightfully mm-hmm. so. I mean, like, he should be in MVP consideration. But to answer your question, I don't think he jumps over Acuna if Acuna keeps up th- this type of pace. So the last year, somebody hit 400. Do you know the answer? 57. 1941. Ted Williams hit 406. Okay. Uh, I believe he went six for eight the last day in a double header in order to stay up there over 400. Do you think he was the MVP? Gosh, man, you're making me look bad right now. I should know this. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, no, you shouldn't. You're 37. No, he was not the MVP. Correct. Joe DiMaggio ran away with the MVP that year. That was also the year that DiMaggio had his 56 game hitting streak. If you look at the stats, the stats are not close. Ted Williams should have gone, ran away with the thing. Go look at his OPS, his slugging. Obviously, we didn't factor that stuff in back then. But even just the basic power numbers were better. And the dude hit 406 on top of everything else and Joe DiMaggio. Now, the only time in my lifetime that I've seen it come close, two times, George Brett in 1980, he hit 390. Now, he missed a substantial number of games, but did 
still uh, hit 390 on the year, and Kansas City made the World Series. He ended up winning the MVP. The other time was 1994, the strike-shortened season, where we didn't have a World Series. Tony Gwynn hit 394. 394! Had an awesome year. OPS over a one daughter. Once again, we didn't really factor that into the equation back then in voting. Where do you think he finished in the MVP voting that year? 394 he hit. What was the year? 94. I have no idea. Fifth. He finished seventh. Oh, he finished man. seventh. Jeff Bagwell ran away. A lot of homers, I'm now. sure, around around that time. Oh, yeah. And Bagwell could run, too, and play defense. It was the year that he and Frank Thomas won the respective MVPs. Born the same day, by the way, those two, interestingly. Um, I guess my point is that that as amazing as 400 sounds, it's not a punch your ticket to MVP or anything else. It's just not. I mean, if you were to have a draft right now of the most dangerous hitters in baseball, when does Luis Arise get drafted? Now it depends what what your definition of dangerous is. If we're talking about you need a knock with a runner on scoring with a runner in scoring position, I Good. think he gets drafted pretty damn high. You're building a team of hitters. Okay, then when does no, he get then, drafted? He does, then he doesn't get drafted high. Probably I don't know twentieth. Right. We don't value. But it. we just, but answer my question that I just gave you right back at your face, see Rosie. If you need uh-huh. a, a knock with a runner on second base, mm-hmm. you need a single. When does he get drafted then? Very high. Top five. Very high. Easily. Easily top five. Yeah, because he's a pain in the ass to pitch against. He'll foul it off, foul it off. He can get to anything. he doesn't strike out. Right. He gets to everything. He is just one of those annoying hitters. And I mean that in a positive light. But But I don't think The game isn't built for singles. It's not. No, it's not. Not at all. Now, he does have over, I think, a 900 OPS, doesn't he? I mean, uh, most of that is from singles. He doesn't walk right. a ton either. He's never walked a ton, no, right? No, he doesn't. No. Um, Ted Williams' baseball <laughs> reference page. I got to be honest. Haven't been on it a bunch. Haven't really needed to. You just you know Ted Williams is good. Ted Williams isn't good. He is what the fuck great. Oh, my <laughs> goodness, dude. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I and just... You know- the three years... T- serving our country and coming back right away and winning the MVP is maybe the greatest story in baseball history. That's what they said. They said Ted Williams is the greatest hitter that ever lived. And he was a better fighter pilot than that, that his vision was so pristine. Well, you know why? One of the reasons I named my son Theodore. Wow. There you go. All right. Still can't get past the whole frozen head. I I don't know. I have a hard time with that story. Of that. You do? You love the frozen head? Yeah, of course I do. How do you not love that? Is it just his head? Weird. It's weird. It's not his whole body? They didn't freeze the whole body? It was like this small little compartment for his head? I think just his head is cryogenically oh, okay. frozen. I read up Isn't on it? that one one day. I, I, I read up on the... the, the company that does that that's an interesting company yeah it's all right i'm just kind of freaked myself out i'm gonna go on to this this is like black mirror man i want to tell you a little bit about bird dogs we are officially in summer you're gonna be wearing shorts all the time so you want to be comfortable you want to look good bird dogs check check they're Stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg giving you a truly sculpted look Bird dog shorts fit way better than those regular shorts made of the stiff, restrictive cotton. Those things stink. Give those away. Go get yourself a bird dog's order. They fix the issue by inventing cloud knit fabric. It looks just like khaki, but it stretches so you get the way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. It's all about looking good, and it's all about being comfortable. You don't want to be at that barbecue, sit in that chair, and you're like, damn, the boy's got no room. Uh Uh-uh. Thanks to bird dogs. Everything is feeling great. And on top of that, you know it's hot out. Some places where you might live, it gets really sticky. Bird Dog uses the anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. That's so important for them gems south of the equator. So head on over to birddogs.com slash today 
Not only are you going to get a great order in multiple colors, you also get a free Yeti-style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash today, a free Yeti-style tumbler. Go do your thing. Mets owner Steve Cohen is going to be doing his thing later today before the Mets take on the Brewers. He's going to have a little powwow with the media. Tweeted this out on Tuesday. I will be doing a press conference tomorrow before the game. You will get it straight from me. Do you want to hear from New York's owner? And if so, what do you want to hear? Of course I want to hear from him. I wish I wish this was like a, a prerequisite for all owners, each year having to come and speak, do some sort of forum. Once a year, it doesn't seem like that far-fetched to me. I mean, twice a year, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear it. Um, so I'm very interested. And what do I want to hear from him? I want to hear the strategy. Like he's he's involved in these some of these decisions. I mean, I think he he runs the team that way where he wants to feel like he has some input and some say on what goes on. Obviously, he has the end all be all input, but like from a day to day operations standpoint, I feel like I don't know this for sure. I feel like he's probably wants to be involved some in some capacity when he's feeling like it. He wants to be able to be involved. Um, so what do I want to hear? I, I, I want to hear what the plan is going forward. If they think they can salvage the season, if they think they made some mistakes in free agency, if they think that, um, you know, they will sell or won't sell or add or not add, it's, it's going to be fascinating. I, I hope he gets into some of that and not just, you know, some, you know, uh, vague, you know, talks about the team. If you come out and say, Hey, hear it from me directly then I hope you get into some some specifics. And I think he will. He's that, he, I feel like he's that kind of guy that he will get into to some of those specifics. Couldn't this backfire on him? I mean, if they're going to say, so does that mean you're not going to fire Buck Showalter? So now in the middle of a shitty season, he has to throw it down one way or another? Because if, let's say he says, hey, I'm not making any changes. And let's say another month goes by and they still stink and he ends up firing Buck, then what? I think that there's ways to word all of uh, his answers that he's probably been prepped with. You know, he knows he's going to get then some of those questions. what's the point questions. of having this? Well, I mean, I think he wants to be accountable. He wants to be a new age owner. That's what I think. Like, he wants he, to be, he wants his name and his face associated with the Mets. We talked about this, man. Like, this is what guys who buy these teams nowadays, a lot of the times they want to, it's, it's social status for them. And I think Steve Cohen wants to be that for this team and in a positive manner. So will he have some pre-written answers? 100%. These guys like this don't go unprepped and just say, whatever you want to ask me, ask me. Like I'd assume there's probably some topics that are off limits for this press conference. And they're probably going to tell people that. So, you know, we're not going to get like the entire truth. What do you mean? You don't think that happens? Dude, you cannot tell the New York press you can't ask him about this. That, that I'm telling you, dude, that doesn't work in Milwaukee, let alone in New York. It it happens. It happens. And he can also say, I'm not going to comment on that. Not that's not for today. That's fine. He can he can say whatever he wants. His answers can be fine. The question thing is is ridiculous. Um I have said many times, particularly when talking about Fisher, the owner out in Oakland, I I have come out on the show and said it twice a year. The ownership in all sports should have to meet with the media beginning of the season, end of the season. I don't know what this is going to accomplish in the middle of the year. I think if anything, it's going to make it worse because now the players who have had a bad enough season anyway, and most of those Mets have stood in front of their lockers and been accountable. It doesn't make Mets fans feel any better because the, the play has been so poor, but they, they haven't turned and hid. Okay. Now they're going to be having reporters all around their locker, win or lose tonight, talking about what Steve Cohn said. Would you want to answer for what your owner said? You've got enough shit going on. You you tell me. I think that's just part of the gig, bro. You may not like it, uh, depending on what he says, or you may really like it. You know, like it's it just depends on what he says, but it is part of your job to go out there and like he is your boss. Like mm -hmm. that's your boss. So, you know, you were, everyone's stoked when Cohen came in and spent a bunch of money and he's really revamped that franchise seemingly uh, quickly. Uh, so like, I don't, I, as a player, I don't think I'd have a problem. I, I'd be curious to hear what he's going to say. 
Yeah, and, no, and I am who, curious. And, and who's to say he's not in the locker room already? I mean, uh, the poll ads mm, uh, were not in the locker room too often. He said that that was not my space. He'd be out on the field for BP quite frequently. And you know what? I was one of the only guys that would go talk to him. I wasn't scared of him. I liked it. I, I thought that it was cool to talk to the, the boss. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, he liked me because of it. Maybe that's why I'm able to do all these things that the legends I get to do. It is. Um, so like, I, I have maybe a different perception on that than, than most people. And again, I never even had a long-term deal. I fought every freaking day for what I had. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say, whether, whether it's vague or not, I don't really care. I think it's nice that maybe he'll set a precedent that maybe other owners like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. Well, I think it will be fascinating. So from the outside, I think that Steve Cohen has done a remarkable job. I mean, he's been everything you would want in an owner. He spent money. Some people say in the wrong direction, but man, at the beginning of the year, we were all excited. Very few of us were like, oh man, this just ain't going to work. We were all like, God, we can't wait to see. So he's talked about wanting to build the Dodgers East. Obviously their farm system needs to continue to grow if they're going to follow that pattern. Um, But I think he's done a great job. It's just, I don't know what, if I were a Mets fan today, what do you want to hear from him? Oh, hey, uh, Epler and uh, Buck are out, and uh, we are going to change direction today. Like, that's the only time you'd ever hear from an owner during the season, I think. You know what he's going to say? Players got to play better. We put this roster together. There's some guys here underperforming, and, like, oh, bottom yeah, line is – I know, but that's what he'll say. And I think that's fair for him to say that. I think what fans want to hear, if you're a Mets fan, is we're not giving up on this season. We're not going to be trading guys away. Okay, that's fair. I guess that, that, yep. Well, whatever it is, we're going to be talking about it on tomorrow's show because owners just don't meet with the press unless they're making personnel changes during the season. And even then, they don't always show up. Alec Manoa showed up for his first start in the Florida uh, Complex League. It was not good. Two and two-thirds, 11 earned, 10 hits, three Ks, two walks, two homers allowed. Is this as alarming as it appears? It is not. It is not. Now, like, what he had done at the major league level, like, that means so much more than what happens at, you know, the Florida Complex League. And I can give you a million examples of pitchers who hated going onto the backfields and pitching during spring training because it's not – the bats are not approached the same as they are in a big league game. A lot of guys trying to ambush your fastball. Who knows what he was working on here? He could have had, they could have told him, you're not throwing any off speed pitches. We're just trying to locate a fastball today. That happens all of the time. So without any specifics, like I don't, I, I didn't get the scouting report on his pitch mix or anything from the Florida complex league, but the bats are different guys are young dudes coming up there. Very aggressive, trying to take your head off. They're swinging all the time. Um, And again, we don't know what he was working on. He could have been working on one side of the plate. He could have been working on only breaking balls. He could like, there's so many things that just are not real. Essentially, they're not real at bats when you start to do this. And that's what they're, they don't care about the numbers down here. All they want to see is him work on what he needs to work on, whatever that is. So, Yes, it's it's eye popping to see the numbers and it makes for a good social media post and people are going to talk about it. And the people that don't like him are going to be like, oh, look at that. Ha ha ha. But in reality, pitchers, big league pitchers just don't like going to do that because they're, it's just not real, real at bats. So you can't really give credence to stat lines. We both picked Alec Manoa to win the Cy Young. Yeah, tough. That didn't work out so well. Do you think that he pitches this year in the bigs? It's a good question. I never really thought about that. I don't. Think um, he does. I, I I think that they want to keep him out of out of the spotlight. I think if they feel like there's any possibility of resurrecting his career, and he's, I mean, how old is he? Twenty three. 24, whatever he is, he's got a long time. And this is a victory lap for all haters of Alec Manoa. I mean, I saw a ton of it. Some people that work with us, and I was embarrassed for them. I think it's I think it's ridiculous. You can dislike guys, and that's fine. You know, they didn't personally do anything to you. Well, no, he I, picked I, up I Garrett don't... Cole. 
I don't. Like, I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, it, it's just ridiculous. By the way, Manoa is 25. Thank you, Rob Scirocco. Um, and I liked it that Marcus Stroman came out on social media and supported him. It was basically like, all you clowns right now, I can't wait to see him come back to the big leagues and throw it in your face because that's going to happen. Now, I don't know if it's going to happen. I I will admit I'm a little bit worried. Um, I'm rooting for him. I really want to see him get back because I think he's good for the sport. You know, some of the stuff he does rubs people the wrong way. I don't, okay. I think it, at heart, he's a good kid. I've talked to teammates of his and former teammates. Yeah, what, I don't even know why he rubs people the wrong way just because, like, there's so many guys who are super confident and, and competitive. Like, that's what you want in a starting pitcher. Right. Well, we did have the Verdugo incident where, where he, he came out on a podcast and said, you know, he shouldn't be talking shit to our guys. I'm sure you would have felt the same way if you were in that Boston dugout and he was doing it. It happens. It, but do you know how many – that happens all the time. Right. It's it's competitive nature and it's, it's a, a lot of things that go into that. Like, yeah, you might get mad for a second, but that doesn't mean he's a bad person. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you, there's more truth coming out today. Put yourself in front of 50,000 people, 40,000 people with, you know, everything you've ever worked for in your life on the line, pretty much every time you go out there and you have your adrenaline flowing like it's never been flown before and you you either get a big strikeout or you have a bad day. I want to see how you react. I want to see. Because you don't know until you're in that situation. And sometimes you react in a way that's not like how you typically react. Because guess what? You're in a situation that is not like a typical situation. So like we need to chill on, you know, seeing one thing happen on a baseball field where the cameras are and just saying, oh, that person's a bad person. Like it's not how it is, man. Like sometimes the game has crushed you mentally and you're in a weird spot. And it's every day I talk about it, man. It's just over and over and over again. And it can put you into dark places and you can do things that aren't like who you are regularly as a person. So we always have to remember that. Like most people don't have their lives with cameras on them at all times in the biggest situations of their life when they're fighting for everything that they've ever fought for. Like we're judging people in that situation. I don't know, man. Good perspective. Good perspective. Before we get out of here on the YouTube and podcast side of things, there's always amazing defensive plays every night in the show. There were three last night that made me stop and go, oh, those those were awesome. And it was almost seemingly like one was better than the other. Uh, we're going to run a, um, a sound full clip here of three different plays. The first one in Pittsburgh where Palacios robbed Soto. Then you had the uh, combination of Albies and Arcia making a great play in their win over the Twins, and then Bo Naylor saving a screwed-up pitch out and nailing a runner at second. So give a listen. Ball's carrying out to left. Look at this ball carry. Oh! Look at Josh Palacios! Ozzy diving stop. Oh, my. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. I mean, the runner takes off. High throw on a pitch out. Throw to second by Naylor. He still got him. Wow, what a play by Naylor. Which of the three was your favorite? Okay. I'm going to get a little shortstop bias in this one. Those are three incredible plays. The Bo Naylor one's amazing. Like, I love that. I've never robbed a homer before. That was amazing. But one thing that every middle infield combo sets out to do is that play right there. And you talk about it all the time. And I have made this play. It was in the minor leagues, though. Uh, me and Steve mm. Tollison did it together. And uh, he actually was just a yes. immaculate grid uh, participation guy. Uh, but that play, you talk about it all the time. And then eventually when it gets made, it's just so sweet, dude. Look at that thing. That's teamwork. Yeah. That's middle infield combo coming up together. So I'm picking that one. Yeah. Uh, Wash and EY's response in the dugout was great, too. Uh, the Bo Naylor play for me, not just because it's Cleveland, but I don't think I've ever seen that where a guy saves essentially a wild pitch on a screwed up pitch out and then throws a guy out. And it happened right after Trevor Stephan, the pitcher, 
made one of the worst throws I've ever seen to home plate. Go look it up if you haven't seen it before. Um, Rose Rotation, Tyler Glass now episode is out. We just recorded one yesterday with uh, Vinny Pasquantino. That's very, very good and funny. He's hilarious as always. And uh, Austin Hedges in the on-deck circle. We'll be doing one live with him from Dodger Stadium. That'll be coming up in the near future. Um, all sorts of stuff. The ball and play league continued last night. Ploof, it was hilarious because you're such a good athlete. We don't want to talk much about the ending or anything. The first inning, you looked as confused as could be. Well, I was confused. Like there was a lot of things. It's it's similar to baseball, but like there's some there's some differences there. I wasn't running the right way, and when to run, and all that stuff was a little bit difficult for me. But you know, we figured it out. Every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, new uh, new games streaming live at six o'clock Eastern, and this weekend NASCAR. Headed to the streets of Chicago for an unprecedented road course race through the heart of the city. There's been nothing like this in NASCAR's 75 years of existence. And it is a great way to celebrate those 75 years competition, innovation with a one of a kind event. Uh, the field has never seen something like this. Every driver is going to be on a road course. And so we're not just turning left. They've got 12 twists and turns throughout historic Grant Park. So you make sure you're going to check out some unbelievable racing with the playoff spots on the line. You never know what's going to happen. And, of course, Chicago, May through October, one of my favorite cities to go visit. And during July 4th weekend, on top of that, go hang out, go have a blast, and go check out some NASCAR road racing. Get the entire crew together. First ever Chicago street race. That is July 2nd, 530 Eastern on NBC. We are back at it again. Baseball today on Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, 8.30 a.m. Pacific. If you want to join us live for some convo on the AMP app. The rare appearance of one Robbie Scirocco. Good job, Rob. Bobby for the Dolph. always entertaining Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose. We'll see you Thursday on Baseball Today.